to the number one story on the countdown on my favorite topic, me. And I was thinking about the hardcore definition the other day of one's favorite motion picture. I think the hardcore definition is this. If you could watch only one movie for the rest of your life, but whether there's life after death or there isn't, you could watch it then, too, and you could watch it with anybody now or later. Which movie would it be under those circumstances? And by the way, if you say, well, I've got two choices, you forfeit and you can't watch any movies the rest of your life or after it. Well, then I'm taking the film that began in its alternate universe 47 years ago this week. It was a day or two away from its eternal signature line. I'm as mad as hell and I'm not going to take it anymore. Network. The Patty Chayefsky film about the network anchorman who announces he has been fired for low ratings, and so he has decided to kill himself on the air, and his ratings promptly go up. And then he begins to give voice to what are extra-worldly prophecies and warnings. Well, maybe they're that, or maybe they're their pure ravings of unadulterated insanity. Network starred Peter Finch as the newscaster, William Holden as his best friend, the network news boss, Faye Dunaway as the network programmer who sees in this newscast a gold mine, and Robert Duvall as the ambitious new network chief who sees in the newscast his ticket to the corporate boardroom. When I first saw Network as a 17-year-old aspiring TV broadcaster, my jaw dropped, and it stayed dropped. And in the last 46 years, my jaw has barely moved from that position. The world of TV news that Network predicted was not unthinkable in 1976, but it was a nightmare. Today, virtually everything Chayefsky saw in the future has come true and is accepted as conservative broadcasting. The movie was so prophetic that younger viewers sometimes see the quality of the film and its artistry and its genius, but they can't imagine what the big deal was about its content. It's just showing TV news the way it's always been. So a while ago, I sat down and watched Network and I took notes. I counted 23 major things about TV news that were not true when Network came out, but are true now. And they cover basically everything in the business. First of these, the on-air breakdown of a newscaster. Peter Finch's Howard Beale announces he's going to shoot himself on the air in one week. There was a local news anchor named Christine Chubbuck who had already shot herself during a newscast in Sarasota in 1974, but she did not give advance warning nor show any indication of emotional distress. Sadly, tragically, she just did it. But after Network, things began to come apart at the seams in local news and network news. In 1988, after reporter Bree Walker of New York's Channel 2 News had concluded a story on birth defects, veteran anchor Jim Jensen questioned her at length about a hand and foot deformity which she herself suffered from and whether or not her parents would have aborted her had they known in advance she had the condition. Shortly afterwards, Jensen, who had been on the air in New York forever, entered a rehab center for treatment of alcohol, prescription drug, and cocaine abuse and depression. Later in 2004, Dan Harris had a live panic attack on ABC's Good Morning America, losing his breath and cutting his newscast short. Second of the prophecies, Network posited that such a breakdown would lead not to treatment nor removal from a broadcast, but to greater success. Fifteen years ago, Glenn Beck began to regularly weep on the air. If that was not an indication of emotional trouble, it might have been the attempt to convey that feeling. Legitimate or contrived, Beck was rewarded. And the ABC newscaster I just mentioned, Dan Harris, would go on to do a World News Tonight feature on his own on-air breakdown. Third prophecy, when Howard Beale first tells his boss Max Schumacher, played by William Holden, that he will kill himself on the air, Schumacher goes off on a drunken flight of fancy about a new Sunday night news show he called in his mind The Death Hour. Suicides, assassinations, mad bombers, mafia hitmen, automobile smash-ups, he says, and a terrorist of the week. Schumacher's utterly dystopian forecast has not made air yet, but... The terrorism of 9-11 did play out live on all networks, and parts of that terrorism are repeated minimally, annually, 
Much of a network like True TV consisted of programs that were merely edited highlights of disasters, centering, in fact, largely on, as Max Schumacher phrased it, automobile smash-ups. The fourth network prophecy, Beale swears repeatedly during his newscasts. In the last few years, CNN in particular has made the decision to quote words that would have been bleeped less than a decade ago. And at least one broadcast television program, The Late Late Show with Craig Ferguson on CBS, produced its show live to tape with an audience and in real time let the host swear copiously and then would bleep him just as copiously for the broadcast itself. Maybe the scripted swear in the newscast is not far away. Fifth of the network prophecies, newscasts did not do stories about other newscasts before network premiered. When Beale announces his intention to kill himself, all of New York's local 10 and 11 p.m. newscasts made it their lead story. At this point, and in ensuing years, even monumental retirements, such as Chet Huntley's retirement in NBC in 1970, or Walter Cronkite's retirement from CBS in 1981, had only merited the briefest of footnotes on rival network programs. But by the time of Peter Jennings' lung cancer announcement in 2005, a newscast or newscaster could become the lead story on another newscast. Indeed, when I left MSNBC in January 2011, announcing it mid-show, CNN's Anderson Cooper 360 not only led its live broadcast at 10 p.m. ET with it, it devoted a dumbfounding 22 minutes to something that would have been ignored even a decade before. Understand how long 22 minutes is on CNN. I retired from the broadcast countdown on MSNBC and was able to get home before he was done covering the story of my retiring from the broadcast. Sixth, and this was the key to everything in network and cinch network. Patty Chayefsky and his script forecast a moment in which newscasts would be required to make money. It had not been that way before. News divisions were considered public service, the price the networks paid to make billions off entertainment shows. Robert Duval, as Frank Hackett, the executive, attacks UBS's, quote, cruddy news division and its annual $33 million deficit. As Hackett later tells UBS stockholders, in effect, the news division would be reduced from an independent division to a department accountable to network. After CBS was sold in 1987, the news budget was cut in half and the moment arrived. Newscasts from there on in had to be profitable. In 2012, NBC took it to a new level by appointing a programming executive with no news experience to oversee all news on all of its networks, stations, and even local cable systems. The reason Pat Ichavsky could see this when others could not was that he had worked in live television drama in the 1950s, particularly on one show called You Are There, in which CBS news reporters and actors reenacted great moments from history. The newscasters could make extra cash on the side, and the network made huge profits. The host of You Are There, half news, half entertainment, was Walter Cronkite. The seventh network prophecy, criminals videotaping their own crimes. A series in network is created after a terrorist group called the Ecumenical Liberation Army shoots film of its own members robbing a bank. This was inconceivable in 1976, yet is today a facet of every act from the simplest self-taped vandalism uploaded to YouTube to actual terrorist attacks, recordings of which are made by and then disseminated to news organizations by the perpetrators. The eighth prophecy of network, television news as rage. Quote, the American people want somebody to articulate their rage for them, says Faye Dunaway's character, Diana Christensen. Relative to cable news in particular, does this even require me to elaborate at all? Ninth, Christensen, not a news executive, is then given control over and permission to program Beale's newscast, the UBS Evening News. Although there was a history of news personnel being involved in entertainment programming, Edward R. Murrow also did an interview show called Person to Person, evening newscasts were sacrosanct. 
Today, the fiction may be maintained that they're still sacrosanct, but since the advent of the consultant on the local news level in the late 1970s and early 80s, more and more decisions about not just who does the news, but what goes on the news have been made by non-news executives. The tenth prophecy. Diana Christensen also foretells the various genres of five nights a week network programming. That didn't happen before network. She sees a profit center in a cheaply produced, low-budget program that can run Monday through Friday and which happens to be about the news. The other networks then try to find their own outlandish newscasts and run them five nights a week. Pat Achevsky is now anticipating every genre of craze that followed in news, from Nightline to Dateline to Who Wants to Be a Millionaire to American Idol to the NBC 2009 experiment in which they put Jay Leno on for a comedy show every night at 10 p.m. The 11th Prophecy Network anticipates government deregulation and what it would do to TV. When the UBS president objects to a pornographic network news show and warns the FCC would kill us, Robert Duval, as Hackett, dismisses him and the FCC and foretells the declawing of the commission. The FCC can't do anything except wrap our knuckles. Again, does anything the FCC has not done in post-network television need any detail from me? Twelfth, news commentary devolving into rants and takes. Wait, what did I write here? News commentary devolves into rants and takes? I've never heard any news commentator ranting. What the hell is this? The rest of this rant about the relevance of the movie network right after this. Before the break, I was about halfway through my look at the remarkably prescient 1976 film Network, which foresaw things we thought impossible then ranging from TV news covering TV news as news to terrorists videotaping their own terror and giving it to newscasts to the 12th thing that Network foretold, the evolution or devolution of news commentary into takes and rants. What in substance are we proposing? New Network Chief Hackett asks his horrified colleagues. Then he answers his own question. Merely to add editorial comment to our news show. Brinkley, Severide, Reasoner all have their comments. Now Howard Beale will have his. Hackett's erasure of a line between nuanced, thoughtful scripts of commentary, agonized over by commentators, producers, and executives, and ad-libbed madness, foresaw the similar real-life change. Not merely were comments added to newscasts, but the standards for what constituted useful public commentary dropped from an ages-old tradition of newspaper editorials and columnists to verbal graffiti, spontaneously letting out his anger. The 13th Network prophecy, newscasters and commentators never used to claim that God told them what to say. Though Beale specifically quotes the voice who tells him to tell the people the truth as also saying that that voice is not God, Beale still says he feels, quote, imbued and connected to all living things. The leap for a commentator from hearing your inner voice to hearing somebody else's inner voice was preposterous enough as it was, but reality took it further. While Glenn Beck may not have claimed God was writing his commentaries for him, in April 2012, according to the UT San Diego News, he told an audience in Rancho San Diego that God did tell him to quit his job at Fox News Channel. On the day he decided to leave, they wrote, Beck said he walked up to a floor-to-ceiling window in his New York apartment and asked his wife, how could this possibly be God's plan? As I stood there, the Lord whispered to me, if you do not leave now, you will lose your soul, Beck said. It was the easiest decision I've ever made. Beck also later announced that God not only wanted Mitt Romney to be president, but had put him behind in the polls so that when Romney won, everyone would see a modern miracle. How'd that one turn out for you, Glenn? The 14th Network Prophecy Network accurately predicted that journalists would stop throwing themselves in front of professional train wrecks. The same year that Network was released... A House committee wanted correspondent Daniel Shore of CBS News to testify about where he got a copy of a secret report. He refused. CBS pressured him to testify, so he quit. 
He quit his job. But Network foretold that Shore would be among the last to do something like that. William Holden's Max Schumacher tries to derail the Howard Beale prophecy and rage newscast by telling Robert Duvall's Frank Hackett, you want me out of here? You're going to have to drag me out of here kicking and screaming and the whole news division kicking and screaming with me. Hackett dismisses him. You think they're going to quit their jobs for you? Not in this recession, buddy. The premise of the integrity of news people was as widely held as the integrity and inviolability of a news division. And yet in each downsizing, redesigning, and boulderization of the old standard concept of news, again, Patty Chayefsky foresaw correctly. The number of public protests, let alone public exits, has been negligible in the last 30 years. Dan Rather railed against the gutting of CBS in 1987, That's been about it. And for all the other good things Dan has done, he didn't quit his job. Fifteenth, Network foresaw reality television and the staging of news. When Christensen meets with the activist Lorraine Hobbs and her attorneys to program their terrorism show The Mao Zedong Hour, she is not merely reflecting the coming amorality of reality television, nor just amplifying the already extant, if it bleeds, it leads mantra of local news. Through her, Patty Chayefsky is also foretelling a time when television would begin not to cover the news, but to orchestrate it. If the networks have yet to actually be guilty of misprision of a penalty regarding terrorists, we hope, surely on a lesser scale, the 1992 NBC scandal over faked video of Chevy trucks exploding after collisions confirms the basic premise of adding programming helper to the actual news. Somewhat more remotely, event recreations were once absolutely impermissible in news. They are now one of its staples. There are eight more prophecies, and they all fall into one category. Howard Beale's revised newscast, The Network News Hour, has components in it, eight of them, that would have been thought absurd in any newscast anywhere the day that the film Network premiered in 1976. Number one. It has a studio audience. Countless newscasts, particularly on cable, have now used studio audiences. MSNBC's Donahue did it nightly in 2002-2003. Others, like Anderson Cooper and Chris Matthews and Chris Hayes, have experimented with it. Number two, predicting the news. On The Beale Show, Sybil the Soothsayer actually predicts the news. Well, nobody has done that yet. Not literally. But what does every specialty newscast, especially political ones, do in its last broadcast before Monday? Almost invariably, there is some kind of prediction or forecast for the week ahead, what to look for. And if it is not institutionalized in that distinct a manner, the show still contains pundits who do nothing but forecast tomorrow's news. As long ago as 1998, we would try on Thursday night to guess where the Clinton Lewinsky story was going and what we could give them to put in the pre recorded promos that would run on Monday, three days later. Number three, trial obsessed TV news. There is a Howard Beale segment called Jim Webbing and his It's the Emmis Truth Department. The script is a little vague. We don't know. Is the Emmis Truth a series of hard to believe news stories? Does the giant logo behind Jim Webbing of justice carrying her scales suggest it's a regular report on trials and the law? Or is the emphasis on Emmis as in you've been lied to? Here's the real truth, not the cover up. Which is it? Well, does it matter which? Do we not have all of them concurrently every hour? Fourth, public sexual scandal coverage. Another Beale segment stars Miss Mata Hari and her skeletons in the closet, and she stands in front of a giant keyhole. This is something beyond just gossip, and it has become the sustaining joy of all newscasts from the cheesiest local station to PBS, the public sex scandal. Ask Bill Clinton. Ask Madison Cawthorn. Fifth, opinion polls as news. Beale has a regular segment called Vox Populi, the calculation and reporting of public opinion. This one is the hardest to explain to younger viewers of the film network. 
But the idea of running polls, especially polls conducted by the news organization that would then televise the results of those polls, was laughable when Chayefsky saw it coming. Now, TV news organizations like MSNBC will not only employ somewhat reliable polling morning, noon and night, but they'll also employ text polls in which viewers are asked if a particular Republican is A, evil or B, just stupid. Moreover, every newscast believes in, relies on and most of them commission their own polling for everything and treats the results as breaking news. Guilty is charged here. I did it then, I do it in this podcast. Six, the corporate influence. Beale opens the first edition of the Network News Hour with the death of network president Ed Ruddy and the ascent of Frank Hackett and the full control of UBS by the company CCA. Beale asks, when the 12th largest company in the world controls the most awesome goddamn propaganda force in the whole godless world, who knows what? blank will be peddled for truth on this network. The cross promotion between GE and NBC and its various networks and channels or Universal Studios when the former owned the latter or between Disney networks and Disney products, ABC, ESPN, the cross quotation of one News Corp print entity by a News Corp broadcast entity or Fox News and the like. That was only the start But what is Fox News? What is OAN? What is Newsmax? What is the serious coverage of the entire big lie about the 2020 presidential election? You think those are the newscasters thinking all that up? It is exactly what Chayefsky had Beal warn of. What if the corporations own all the television networks and tell you what they, the corporations, want you to hear? Seven, direct involvement of corporate CEOs in news content. Well, I know of no meeting in which a real-life equivalent to the Ned Beatty character, one of the great characters in motion picture history, Arthur Jensen, preaches fire and brimstone to Howard Beale to get him to do what he, Jensen, wants. But I can tell you without fear of contradiction, as a witness to this, that corporate CEOs will tell individual newscasters what they want personally, directly, and with the threat of retribution, spoken or otherwise. Just yesterday here, I mentioned Jeff Immelt, the head of GE in the summer of 2009 during the well-publicized GE swoon over MSNBC's criticism of Immelt's friends at Fox News. Eventually, it was all resolved when Immelt had me come up to the private GE NBC dining room atop 30 Rock in New York City, along with NBC President Jeff Zucker, to hash it all out. This thing lasted two hours. When I finally asked Immelt, is this a question of never criticizing Fox again or how much we criticize Fox? He said, how much? And I said, well, I can do less. And he said, well, great. Really? Then it's resolved. Let's eat. And that's when Immelt confirmed that he had met on this topic with Rupert Murdoch, the CEO of News Corp, and that Jeff Zucker had met with Roger Ailes, who ran Fox News, to discuss what the Fox Corporation and the NBC Corporation would and would not allow their television networks to report about each other. Eight. Lastly, assassination. Spoiler alert about the movie network. I don't think anybody has actually been killed by his own bosses for having lousy ratings. But the moral equivalent? Character assassination of a network's own newscasters? That is a regular technique to undermine them, to discipline them, to make them more malleable, to get away with firing them. In Aaron Sorkin's newsroom, his employers were themselves leaking gossip about their newscaster, played by Jeff Daniels, to the tabloid newspaper they also owned. But I know for a fact that past bosses of mine at NBC leaked to the New York Post in hopes of making me fear for my job. When current TV tried to fire me to get out of having to pay me roughly $50 million it still owed me, it actually hired a former White House spin doctor to make up and spread stories with his contacts about me in hopes of getting themselves off the financial hook. 
If you have never seen the movie Network, all that I've been through in the last 20 minutes probably makes it sound like some sort of drab, almost academic treatise on declining journalistic values and personal moral decay. Well, it's anything but that. It is exciting, hilarious, surprising, terrifying, and it's virtually perfect with brilliant acting and a subtle but perceptible sense that everybody in the film and everybody watching the film is detaching slowly and slowly and more slowly, detaching from reality and the reliable world they thought they knew with every passing minute of the film. But mostly, it's just a great flick. If you have not seen it, see it now. To paraphrase for Finch as Beale. So turn off this podcast and go watch Network. Turn it off now. Turn it off right now. Turn it off and leave it off. Turn it off right in the middle of the sentence I'm speaking to you now. 